Okay, so uh, welcome all to uh, the first panel on uh, access to data. Uh, our main speaker, uh, as you heard, is Lisa Austin, who's a professor of law at the University of Toronto, where she holds the chair in law and technology and does interdisciplinary research on privacy and transparency. Uh, and she'll give this paper that Thomas has already told us all about, uh, Safe Sharing Sites. Uh, our commentators are Yafit Lev Aretz, uh, who's an assistant professor of law at the Zicklin School of Business, Baruch College uh, in the City University of New York, and formerly a research fellow here at NYU's Information Law Institute. So it's nice to see her back. Um, like Lisa, she's interested in facilitating the beneficial use of data and balancing privacy against uh, other concerns. And Margaret Quoka, am I pronouncing that right? Thank you. Uh, is Associate Professor of Law at the University of Denver Storm College of Law, uh, where she teaches administrative procedural law and national security law, and has done work on also the access to information side. So with that, I give you Lisa. Thank you, um, and thank you for the invitation to this really terrific um, event. I'm very excited about the whole day. Um, this project on, on safe sharing sites is, is part of a, a series of projects that I'm doing with my, my co-author, David Lee, who's a computer engineer um, at University of Toronto. Um, and some of our projects involve uh, multiple other partners as well. But our main starting point is that they're, they're collaborative between law and engineering. Um, and, and I have no background in, in engineering. I'm a philosopher by training and a, and a lawyer. Um, but one of, uh, when, I, when I say this to people, uh, often I get the reaction, especially in, in our world and the law and policy world, it's like, great, because you really need to go and talk to those engineers and computer scientists and tell them about all the values they need to embed in their technologies. And I think, yeah, that's an interesting project. That's totally not our project. Um, <laughs> so what, what we're trying to do is look at problems, particularly around privacy and transparency, that we both care a lot about and have all the deep professional commitments to and research projects around, um, and, and see how, if we actually share our toolkits and insights and really work the problem in a collaborative manner that the solution space opens up in kind of interesting new ways. So it's a two-way street. It's not a project of colonizing um, engineering with uh, the values of law, but, um, uh, but learning actually um, from what the, this other sort of side has to offer. And my plug when you're establishing this really exciting area of data law is that we open up this kind of very new forms of interdisciplinarity um, in law. I mean, there's a number of people across uh, the US and Canada and the world doing this kind of work. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of it um, as this progresses and it's very doable. I say as the philosopher who talks to engineers, um, you can do it too. So, um, then we call this paper Safe Sharing Sites. It's a play on safe injection sites. Um, sometimes, you know, I'm a privacy lawyer um, as well, and, and when I talk to privacy lawyers, you know, we, we get the heebie-jeebies when you start talking about sharing data. It's like doing drugs. So, um, so, so, hence the safe sharing sites. It's like, no, you know, we can do this in a, in a safe manner. We can reduce harms and um, uh, and and, and re alleviate some of these concerns, or at least that's the hope. So in this project, the problem we started with, and I want to sort of give you our starting point, because it's actually one of the examples we use in the paper, um, and because and, it shows you how we started to think about this, is, is the open data um, issue in relation to smart cities. So we're from Toronto. Everyone in Toronto is talking about sidewalk labs. Um, and their proposed redevelopment of, of part of the waterfront. It's a huge public discussion. It's very interesting and exciting, and um, whether you're a critic or enthusiastic about it, it's um, very um, interesting times in Toronto. And so one of the things that has come out of this is, you know, there's a lot of concern about sidewalk labs coming in and, and building, helping to build this infrastructure of, of data collection and concerns from the sort of Torontonian saying, well, does that mean we're handing over all this data to basically Google? Um, and, uh, and how do we make sure that, um, you know, the, the public interest still is reflected and that others get access to this data to innovate and do interesting things um, with it? So there's been a lot of discussion about open data, that uh, this data should be open by default and publicly released to um, whoever wants to use it to do interesting things. 
That obviously has privacy issues, and the privacy issues are um, proposed to be solved through de-identification. So we're going to have these massive data sets, we're going to de-identify them, then we're going to publicly release them. This is sort of the open data proposal. Um, and so there's, there's a couple problems with this, and this is kind of where we started from. One of them is the failure of de-identification, and, and there's a you know, robust technical literature about this. It's very difficult to de-identify data. There's always a risk of re-identification. So we can mitigate those risks. There's lots of techniques to do that, but many of the techniques to mitigate those risks result in data that's less accurate. And so if your goal is to give access to data so people can innovate, and compete with the Googles of the world, and your solution is de-identification where to mitigate those risks of re-identification results in less accurate data, you've got a problem, right? Um, there has to be a different way of doing that um, and meeting that goal. The second problem with the open data solution is this idea that suddenly, if you just de-identify this data, suppose we can solve the, the re-identification problems, or at least just set that aside. Suppose that's true, we can just de-identify this data, there's this assumption that then data just wants to be free. There's no more normative question about it. We can just release this data and people can do whatever they want with it for whatever purpose because we're going to release it so people can be in different countries using it. People can do it for all sorts of different things. Um, and you know, our position is this is even if it's no longer data about um, individuals, it's still data about people, right? And data is social, and it's not doesn't exist and shouldn't be accessed and used in this um, a way of thinking about this kind of like this norm-free zone. There are always politics and power and, and ethical norms that are potentially at play. Whether that means we want to regulate that. I'm agnostic about it, but just to put on the table that just because you de-identify something it's not personal information doesn't mean it's not information about people, doesn't mean you're dealing with it in some kind of norm-free zone. Um, so as we started to, to think about that, we were trying to think about this, this basic issue, how do you share data without um, compromising the privacy and security of data subjects? Um, but also make the sharing something that can be sort of transparent and accountable should you want to um, put limits on the access and, and use in different sorts of ways. Um, and then something kind of interesting happened. We started noticing that a whole bunch of other problems we've been talking about and thinking about um, actually technically, from a technical perspective, were the same problem totally different legally. So we had all these kind of sharing contexts and they're outlined in the paper that have very, very, very different legal contours. So lawful access, we, had a, we talk about cell tower dumps, um, and uh, litigation context where people might want access to data sets in order to, um, you know, because of, of things that are, are being litigated in, in Canada. This came up recently in some tobacco litigation. Um, and uh, run-of-the-mill sort of data protection law context, we talk about online advertising and, and ad auctions in the paper. These all have different legal contours, but technically we tried to isolate in the paper that there's a kind of technical core that remains the same. Um, and that was interesting to us. And we have another example we're going to put in the, the final paper around um, uh, insurance. So we're interested in the, the fact that of where um, you know insurance companies want you to uh, let them collect information about your driving habits, right, in order to um, uh, give you different rates. So, so these are all have different kind of legal contours. But the the kind of problem we started thinking about was, you know, if you're thinking about this as infrastructure, a kind of technical problem that needs to be solved and standardized. Um, and be able to be solved once, right, rather than everyone reproducing this solution in multiple ways, is there a way of doing this that can then be plugged into different kinds of legal contexts? So that was where our idea of the safe sharing sites came from as this way of kind of solving the technical issues once, and then could you build what we call a legal interface that would allow different kinds of law and regulation to kind of plug and play with it um, in a certain kind of way. And software development kind of works like this sometimes. You create software modules and you know, the people who use them don't need to know anything about how the software works. You don't need any understanding of the internal operation of the software. What you care about is the interface. Um, and, and you can think about this even just when you're driving a car. You don't know how your car works. Well, some of you might. I don't know, but I don't know how my car works. But, um, but you know, you get in and there's a steering wheel and there's, you know, your pedals and, and they work in a certain kind of way, so you just get in and you drive. Um, 
And so that's kind of the, the basic idea. Um, and the legal interface that we started to talk about because we want to be agnostic about how this works because we want it to work for lots of different legal contexts and lots of different legal jurisdictions where you know, people can make their own choices. Um, but a lot of it is around kind of enabling certain kinds of transparency and accountability. Um, so our idea was that you would have a, a registry where you would have to put down, um, you know, what's the you know, purported legal authority for, you know, one organization wanting to share this information with the other one. Um, the other organization would not get access to the raw data. They would, the, the analysis would have to be happening in this kind of controlled environment in the safe sharing site. Um, but the registry would record who wants to share that information, right? And some kind of basic information about that. Jurisdiction information, I think, would be important. Um, and then f and another part of the accountability was, would be that this would be auditable um, in different sorts of ways. And then the idea would be that, that if you have this information available, then different kinds of regulatory solutions can kind of interact with this in different sorts of ways. Um, and, and even there, we think that there's a lot of room for, you know, helping regulators. So I'm going to talk from the kind of public regulation perspective. It doesn't have to be public regulation. It can be different kinds of private ordering. Um, but say a privacy commissioner, we have a lot of experience with this in Canada. If they want to know certain things that are going on, um, you know, you might have thousands and millions of these transactions happening. But if you had the registry and you had it standardized in a certain kind of way, you could automate some of this. You could build tools that would make this activity visible to regulators at scales that aren't currently possible. We have a whole world of data sharing and data use going on that we cannot see. And the regulators are overwhelmed. Um, and what they need are tools to help them sift through this kind of activity, right? And, and yeah, you, there's lots of work you'd have to do to kind of figure out how to make that work, but it's totally um, doable. And so we, we would envision that there would be um, uh, tools like that that would build on top of that. Um, and that we think that if you could create a kind of infrastructure like this, it could also enable other forms of, of regulation that might be difficult to contemplate now. So for example, if you thought that there should be broad ac rights of access to data held by companies, um, so again, this is the Sidewalk Labs um, uh, kind of discussion going on in Toronto. You know, it's one thing when it's kind of a municipal private partnership to say, well, you know, there should be public access to this data. Maybe we're going to be in more difficult territory if it's just the private company. Um, but I think there's like good arguments to say that in some context you should have rights of access to this data if you're worried about the data monopolies. How are you going to make that work um, if you had this kind of controlled environment in which it'd be easy to um, provide forms of access in ways that are controlled and auditable, um, then it might seem like a solution that could work more easily than if you don't have it. Or we use an example in our paper about lawful access, um, where we think the, the police shouldn't be able to do sort of bulk surveillance techniques like cell tower dumps unless they do it. We're using um, uh, some of the advances in, in, in encryption technology where you can actually do analysis on encrypted data. Um, and we know that the, the result of that, when, when, when we talk about this to police, is like, yeah, we're never going to do that because, you know, how are we going to build that and the tools don't exist and so it's not going to happen and the courts aren't going to require it as a kind of reasonableness requirement. There's an argument in Canadian law to make that that could be the case. But if there's no practical alternative to do this, it's not going to happen. The minute you build the practical alternative, it's on the table, at least um, in certain kinds of, of legal contexts. So we think that something like this can actually enable new possibilities um, in, in different sorts of contexts as well. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll stop there. There is a debate going on in Toronto about data trusts and the use of data trusts, but it's all very murky right now. I'm happy to take questions about that later. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, can you hear me? So uh, first I want to thank, uh, thank the organizers of this wonderful conference. Um, NYU seems to be on fire with tech law conferences mm -hmm. this month. So keep up the good work, and I'm always happy to be back. Um, I also would like to thank Lisa and David for this um, really important scholarly contribution. Before diving into the paper itself, allow me to praise this work for two kind of external reasons. 
The first one is that this work brings together insights from two entirely distinct academic and practical fields. On the one hand, we have law and policy. On the other hand, we have engineering, computer and information science. And in a data economy where data analytics tools are used literally everywhere by a variety of market government players and uh, different private sector players, in different contexts for various purposes, proposing legal and policy recommendations that ignore the technical infrastructure is as useless as proposing technical solutions that ignore the legal, social, and political environments in which they operate. In this work, not only Lisa and David offer, environment, uh, offer sorry, the, the technical and legal backgrounds to understanding the issues at stake, but they also effectively bring together legal and technical tools to solve these issues. I believe that we are at a point where siloed studies around technology are often deemed to hit a wall fairly quickly. This work understands the complexity of both the legal and technical environments and attempts to address the issue from an informed perspective of both. And I encourage everyone in this room to, do, to use similar interdisciplinary approach to thinking about the data economy. The second reason why I feel this work is important has to do with its approach toward sharing data. In a paper, Lisa and David say, you mentioned that already, but I'll quote from the paper. I think, um, sorry, from the paper, it's, uh, to privacy advocates, proposals to share data can sound like proposals to do drugs. Lisa, I respectfully disagree. <laughs> I think that this characterization is not entirely accurate because I personally know some privacy advocates that have fewer issues with doing drugs than with sharing data. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard to blame them. It's hard to blame them. For the privacy community which has dedicated itself to the vital mission of identifying and addressing data-driven privacy harms, Contributing to the sharing of data in what feels like a privacy-corrupt data economy is a morally challenging task. In my own work on the use of corporate data for social good, I borrow from another legal discipline and I argue that this data has the appearance of the fruit of a very poisonous tree and that discussing legitimate ways for the sharing of this data feels like we're almost laundering it. Nonetheless, as someone who undertook a similar task, I cannot understate the importance of discussing the positive externalities of the data economy alongside the negative ones. I believe that it is our duty to take part in this discussion. And it is not only, as Lisa and David note in the paper, because these instances of data sharing are ubiquitous, but also because, <laughs> because it is our responsibility to guide such sharing into structures that increase democratic oversight, consideration of different interests, including those of minorities and marginalized communities, and accountability. Staying out of the conversation does nothing to promote any of these important goals. Stepping in does a lot. Now to the paper. I found the proposal for safe sharing sites to be very interesting and with some refinements and fine tunings, practical and useful. The idea of providing one-stop shop for data sharing through sophisticatedly tailored access protocols sounds very appealing. But as we know, both God and the devil are in the details. Governance questions such as the choice of a facilitating body as well as technical implementation specifics still have to be sorted out. But it is, of course, unrealistic to expect the first work proposing such a sharing structure to provide a comprehensive blueprint from the very beginning. I do wish, however, to offer a general comment about the motivation behind safe sharing sites. It seems like there are three benefits that you're particularly interested in in the context of creating this platform. The first one is innovation and removing barriers to entry. The second one is privacy and security because safe sharing sites mitigate and potentially solve the compromise of privacy and security in data sharing by not allowing access to the raw data. And the third one is transparency and accountability as the safe sharing site provides a controlled environment where operations can be recorded, audited, and transparent. So for the first one, innovation and removing barriers to entry, you don't go into too much detail in the paper, but there is definitely a plausible connection between open data and innovation, and I think there is more to say about that. For, privacy, for security, I think the paper also doesn't go 
uh, doesn't do enough to address questions around security and specifically it treats shares, safe sharing sites as alleviating security concerns but does not acknowledge the creation of a vulnerable consolidation point that might become an attractive target for hacking. For privacy, safe sharing sites sound a lot like a safer and more granularly tailored de-identification tool. When you discuss privacy, you seem to take the position that privacy is about secrecy, even though you explicitly reject this view when referring to Helen Nissenbaum's work on contextual integrity. I think you need to do a better, you need to provide a better definition of what you mean by privacy. I will suggest, in fact, that you do treat privacy as control over identification, which I agree with, and that you group all other informational concerns under transparency and accountability. For example, your discussion of data ownership implicitly touches on individual perceptions that involve unjust enrichment. People tend to talk about Google and Facebook as using their data to make money. Such claims are not so much about privacy as they are about the claim for sharing profit to which the use of one's information contributed. Such concern should be discussed under the transparency and accountability prong and differentiated from privacy and identification. For transparency and accountability, I think that the offering of a controlled environment where operations can be recorded, audited, and transparent is to me the most important um, aspect of this safe sharing site. It's the most important benefit. But still there are two pieces that are kind of missing from this puzzle. The first one has to do with the broader informational concerns that are well documented in scholarly writing and include bias, error, discrimination, black box, power structures, manipulation, etc. I would have loved to see more discussion that outlines these concerns and explains how they can or cannot be addressed directly or indirectly by this new infrastructure. In many parts of the paper, you emphasize that safe sharing sites are agnostic to such questions, but we already know that design matters and infrastructure matters even more. So even if they, in time, do in fact do act as mere net neutral platforms, they either exacerbate or mitigate directly or indirectly many of the data-driven problems that I mentioned. I think this should um, be clearly stated and acknowledged. And the second missing piece has to do with the incentives of market players to participate in safe sharing sites in the absence of regulation that obligates them to do so. Um, whether and how private sector actors will be incentivized to use safe sharing sites for sharing data among themselves is a huge open question. That said, again, I love the paper. I look forward to seeing how this conversation around safe sharing sites will evolve in theory and in practice, and I thank you again for this important contribution. Uh, thank you all so much for being here, and I want to thank the organizers, um, like everyone else on our panel, for putting together a really terrific program today. Um, and I want to thank Lisa for the opportunity to, to comment on this uh, extremely important work. Um, you know, Lisa and her co-author David have picked a really exciting topic to explore. Um, and I think it will surprise no one in this room that um, you know, her paper uh, easily convinces that there is a problem desperately in need of a solution. Um, and she provides a, a compelling uh, description of the flaws in the existing models, including de-identification, um, including kind of strictly treating data as property, which I know is going to be a topic of much greater discussion uh, later in the day, um, and including uh, kind of the, the treatment of data as just a problem of aggregation. Um, and, and, and even some of the limitations of, of the more recent developments like data trusts. Um, and so I think, like Yafit, um, I don't know if you're, I'm saying your name correctly, no, but um, my um, my comments go not to uh, not to the kind of central um, thesis that Lisa is advancing, which I find very compelling, but rather to, uh, in fact, the the details and implementation. Um, I think uh, there is no question that. Um, that the value of this project is um, extremely promising. And uh, the idea of trying to find a way to um, 
rebalance the competing, central competing concerns of protecting uh, privacy while actually being able to tap the beneficial uses of data publicly um, is extremely important. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different aspects. Um, the first thing I, I, I want to talk about is what we can learn from other uses of information intermediaries. So as I see the proposal for um, safe sharing sites, it is one version of an information intermediary, um, kind of a third party who will uh, take an input and provide an output. Um, and it's not the first such uh, model we've seen. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we've seen that develop in the context of open government and freedom of information. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit um, about uh, the use of transparency as a regulatory tool. Um, and I'll end with just a list of open practical questions that I had while reading the paper. Um, so on the first topic, information intermediaries. So uh, one, of course, prime experiment with data sharing in, in the US um, is data that's publicly accessible under open government laws. And at the federal level, level, that means the Freedom of Information Act. So in my own work, I've studied who uses FOIA and for what. And um, one of the interesting things that has cropped up is that, in fact, uh, because the government is so bad at data sharing, um, an entire private industry of information intermediaries has arisen. Um, so at many agencies, there are private companies who do nothing more than request uh, federal records under FOIA and compile government data into privately held databases and resell access to those databases at a profit. Obviously, safe sharing sites would have a very different model in terms of the goals. It would not be a profit-driven model. Uh, we would be talking about something that would be working kind of with a, a public interest mission. Yet, I think there's a lot to learn from this experience. Um, so, for example, and it, you can imagine kind of a corollary. So, for example, um, at uh, the Food and Drug Administration, there are multiple companies that do nothing more than uh, request individual uh, facilities inspection reports. Um, and then warehouse databases of those uh, inspection, of inspection data and resell them mostly to uh, regulated businesses, uh, to the industry. Um, at the Securities and Exchange Commission, there's the same thing happening where there are private uh, companies that do nothing more than warehouse uh, databases of, um, of records about, uh, about publicly traded companies that have been submitted to the SEC. And um, these companies have a very different mission, but we also see that they act as pretty significant barriers to accessing these informations, this, this information. So um, the cost associated with accessing databases held by information in intermediaries, the specialized knowledge of, of where to find that data and how to access it, means that basically only industry insiders are in fact taking advantage. Um, and so um, it is one of the, the central reasons for the push behind open data initiatives is the idea that there will be unintended or unanticipated uses, that there will be a low uh, kind of barrier to entry to be accessing that data and finding beneficial uses for it. And I think some of the limited experiences we have with intermediaries uh, can show us that um, the design uh, really makes a difference in terms of how high those barriers are. And so one of the things that I think um, Lisa and David might explore more is how high will that barrier to entry be for data users uh, and will that mean that it significantly cuts back on the benefits of data sharing um, that, that I know Lisa is trying to preserve. Um, so the second uh, kind of topic of my comments today goes um, to the transparency requirements proposed to go along with safe sharing sites. Um, so Lisa and David suggest that safe sharing sites would record all transactions on data um, and uh, that those records would be transparent and audited or auditable. Um, and I think there are certainly many sensible uh, reasons for having that sort of strategy and benefits that would go along with it that are explored in the paper. But I also think it's worth complicating that notion a little bit. Um, transparency of this magnitude, so this kind of second order transparency, transparency about the data sharing process itself, um, generates some risks. Um, one is that transparency as a regulatory tool has always been relatively weak. So um, the idea that we, that people will start to kind of behave well simply because it is uh, public knowledge what they're doing, um, turns out that the literature on that shows that it's a relatively weak form of regulation. 
In fact, depending on the volume of these types of transactions, it may be that there's such a flood of data about what people are doing that almost no one cares or is paying attention. So I think there's a the practical risk there. Um, the second risk, of course, is the nature of regulatory oversight. Lisa um, suggested in her comments, and I think it's really true, that we would need a lot of innovation in terms of regulators um, and what they would be able to do with this data in order to engage in meaningful oversight. Um, and given the, the nature of this conference is on global data law, um, I'll mention, of course, that that opens up a host of questions about where this regulatory uh, oversight would come from. I think um, in addition to that, um, I, there's a, a, a worry about transparency at this level that, uh, depending on how it is operationalized, that this transparency itself could reveal something private in nature. So for example, researchers who are using data uh, in a particular way, if their queries or research design um, then becomes transparent, I wonder whether researchers will be hesitant um, to use the tool. Um, I also wonder whether we might learn things that are true or even skewed about r what research is showing us just by learning about what kinds of inquiries are being made um, before those ideas are fully baked. And finally, I'll, I'll just mention data security as one concern, where we have um, you know, a, a problem even for the biggest companies right in the private sector right now in terms of um, hacking and certainly for the government in terms of leaking. Um, I wonder about kind of a third party intermediary that holds a huge volume of data and the vulnerabilities that are associated with that. And then the last uh, kind of um, devil in the details is, is, is also my, my general um, comment at the end. Um, you know, these entities, these safe sharing sites, um, you know, I think their design is extremely important. Um, are they generating a profit model? Are these nonprofit? Are these quasi-governmental entities? Are they competing with one another? How do we certify them? How do we decide which ones are doing it legitimately or not legitimately? Um, do we let the market determine who is doing safe sharing well or not well? Um, and uh, what are gonna be the incentives or even requirements for particular entities to use safe sharing? Uh, these are, of course, questions about practicality, and uh, I also recognize that um, they are not necessarily, in a piece this ambitious, uh, not necessarily things that need to be explored at this stage, but things to think about uh, in the future or for follow-on research. Um, but given that we're in an age in which companies and governments are collecting, of course, vast amounts of personal information about all of us um, and all of the unanticipated ways in which that information is being used, the questions that Lisa and David are exploring are of the, the most utmost importance. Um, and I'm looking forward to the, seeing the final version of this work. So thank you all for this opportunity again today. You guys were great. One piece of data. Everybody's staying within their time. Uh, before we open it up to questions, Lisa, do you want to um, respond to any of it? Sure, I'll pick up. And these are great comments. I thank you so much. This is a, a, a very much a work in progress, and so this is incredibly useful feedback. Um, I'll just pick up on a couple of points, not, not all of them, but um, I, I feel compelled to say something about data security since it was raised by um, both commentators and because my co-author is mainly a security researcher, so um, I will <laughs> sort of, you know, throw some comments out there. Um, we didn't develop that part in the paper, and, and, and we certainly should, but um, so, so there's more content to be put into that. Um, it's not necessarily the intention of this idea that it becomes some of these shape sharing sites are some kind of warehouse for data. Um, certainly the idea is that, you know, an organization might share data in the site and so that another organization can do some kind of um, analytics on that data for a particular purpose. Um, but there's ways of implementing this that isn't necessarily mean that these become these massive warehouses of data that are, are these security targets. Um, and we didn't get to it just because we ran out of time, but there are uh, things that we were thinking of exploring and talking about, about, you know, you can implement this in a more distributed fashion. Um, um, and also the um, the insurance context that we're interested in, where you know your your driving habits are being sent to your insurance company. There, you know, one of the ideas we're playing with is could you make your phone a safe safe sharing site? Actually, um, so there are lots of kind of interesting um, uh, technical possibilities. I won't say more because I don't understand them in any depth. But um, <laughs> that's the part that my co-author fills in for me. So, um, uh, so so there is more to come on that. We just 
to, to be truthful, ran out of time um, uh, in order to do some of that. Um, but I think the points that you mentioned are, are, are well taken um, with respect to that. Um, and I'll just say something about the, the, the transparency point, um, because it is a, a sort of a tension in the paper, and I think it's probably also a, a tension um, between uh, David and I, you know, when we started collaborating, one of the first things he said to me was, you know, engineers don't like talking to lawyers. Um, you guys get in the way of innovation, right? So, um, so we often, you know, my, my instincts are always to regulate and his instincts are always to say no. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, there's no surprise we landed on this kind of, you know, solution of can we just kind of create more transparency and kind of tools to enable accountability and then should people want to regulate they have a way of doing this, and, and maybe we don't need to agree on, 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 on what that, that looks like. Um, so the point of this is not that you know, transparency, and uh, as we're sort of you know, uh, putting it forth in this paper, is the answer or is the regulation. The idea is that it enables forms of regulation that might happen um, and, and, and be imposed, and that we don't have to agree on what that might look like um, for this to kind of go forward. Um, and so. Uh, so you, you know you're you're right to push on some of those things. It's kind of a, 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 a tension in in our work as well. Um, I like regulation. I love public regulation, but um, <laughs> we're sort of I'm putting that aside for some of this um, uh, to to move forward. Oh, so with that, um, open it up to questions. I have one comment. Um, so uh, translational research in the biotech area has that problem also where some people own trade secrets on target uh, molecules, some people own trade secrets on small molecules, and there are some attempts to create a safe space for um, the companies to be able to use each other's data, and that, that might be another place that you might want to look. So the NIH is doing this, Duke University is doing it, um, so it, it's just another model that, that w might be helpful to look at. Thanks, um, that's great. So I can't actually see the people over there, so you'd have to raise your hands really high. Kevin, did you have a question? Uh, so thanks, Lisa, and, for the, and the commentators. This was really interesting. I only had a chance to skim the paper. So Lisa, I was curious about your reaction to the concerns about having for-profits uh, or manage the, the safe sharing sites, because I could imagine that markets would actually create pressure towards having nonprofits run them, but in principle, it wasn't obvious to me why you should be concerned about having them be administered by for profits, especially if there's some sort of regulatory overlay. So it's just yeah, I'm, I'm actually not on. in principle um, uh, concerned about that. Um, which part of my paper did you think I was? No, the com your commentator uh, oh. <laughs> seemed concerned, so, but I wasn't clear on about the, the idea of having for-profits involved, and so I wasn't clear about your position. That, that, that's why uh, I was asking Yeah, so I don't, I don't yeah. actually have a position. Um, I'm hoping that I don't need to develop one, but maybe I do. Um, so <laughs> I like being agnostic about as much, much as, as, as possible on this, but, um, and, and part of that is just because, you know, I've been talking with my, my colleague, Jillian Hadfield, who's all about sort of these market yeah. solutions, and it's kind of an interesting, she has lots of interesting ideas about those models that I'm sort of open to thinking about. Um, uh, which would be a more for-profit potential model. I don't know. I mean, uh, to, to me, it's not so... Um, uh, I think that it could work with multiple forms of those models, and in the paper we try to say also that, you know, we think it's compatible with some of these things that in Toronto we're talking about, again, in the smart city context around civic data trusts, which would be a sort of public model of governing data, but you'd still need something like a safe sharing site to implement some of the things they want to do. Um, but it could be compatible with other things too. Like I just, um, it's really meant to be, could you create this kind of infrastructure to solve one problem really well, right? Mm -hmm. And then let it play with multiple other sorts of forms of organization and regulation. Lots of time, so don't be shy. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so one question I had about, the, so you mentioned that you're sort of agnostic also about jurisdictional questions. And I, I wonder what the, what, to what extent you think that the, the 
whatever platform actually manages the interaction is able to accommodate different requirements that may come to the requirements of the kind of disclosure of data that is allowable or not that comes with different jurisdiction from different parties. So even from a perspective of accountability, what is required for a party to disclose as part of its own accountability process will vary based on whether it's a public or private party and what jurisdiction it's in. And is the expectation that the two, you know, the A and the B will work that out themselves and provide sort of the technological tools for that, or is that would that be the responsibility of the sharing side as well? And if so, is how would that work? And yeah, that's such a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, part of this is going to require, I think, in this kind of global data context, that you do jurisdictional tagging of data in some way, right? And there's a lot of questions about that. Like, what does that even mean? Are you sort of, you know, going to code the data for what citizenship or where it's collected? Um, or you know where people are resident, and I mean there's so many different choices, and I don't and 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 how that's going to work, um, I don't know. Just at a kind of a basic level, like what do you mean when you say right jurisdictional data? Um, that's why that part of the paper is kind of thin at the moment. <laughs> but, um, so what does that that mean? I mean the kind of basic thought was that. Um, just thinking in that kind of data protection law context, um, so you already have a whole regulatory overlay, maybe not in the US to the extent that, that we have it in, in places like Canada or Europe, um, but there's all sorts of obligations around, you know, what authority you have in relation to the data and what can you do with it, um, as well as an or a different organization in the sense that, you know, what are, are their obligations in relating to getting access to data and doing various things with it. They already have those obligations, um, and so, the, the idea around the kind of the, the, the registry is just to make visible what they're doing in some way so that, you know, regulators can take a look and say whether they're sort of offside or not. Um, but the obligations are already kind of existing in, in those kinds of uh, legal spaces. Um, making that work, yeah, well, I mean, with jurisdiction has kind of been a flag that, that we have in, in the paper of like we need to, to sort of think about what that means because it, it, it gets from a, the very basic, right? What exactly are you tagging when you say you're gonna tag jurisdictional information? Um, and, and, then, and then how does it work? But on kind of like a simple model would just be, you know, so the Canadian Privacy Commissioner um, wants to make sure that certain Canadian companies um, are not improperly sharing information to which they don't have the right, say, consent authority, right? So they could take a look, they would have access to data um, about that, and whether it's public or not, like uh, it doesn't have these, these registries don't have to be like open to everyone's inspection because I think there are privacy confidentiality, et cetera, questions there. But a regulator could have access to it, right? Um, and I would think with they would need automated tools to sift through the huge amounts of information if this were to actually happen. Um, and and so on a kind of basic level, you could make that work, but you could imagine easily the complexities that go from there and whether that would just kind of blow that up and so on the simple level we can describe it and then um and then uh leading from there we know yeah there needs to be a lot more thinking about how that would work yeah. i'm curious about the kind of practical implementation of the of of, of this the safe space um and i'm thinking you know if i want to if i want to do something with new york mta data right it's fully open, and so the burden is on me to figure out what the query looks like, what the analysis looks like, what am I doing with that information? And the, the, the further that information recedes into like a black box, so I'm, I'm coming to some third party and I'm saying, I want to do this kind of query, I'm looking for this kind of information, uh, you have the data, and we're going to have to collaborate to figure out how to extract that information from the data you have, where I can't necessarily see all the information that we're working with. Is, is, is the burden then on the people who are operating the, the, safe, the safe sharing site to help design that query, or do they, they have some sort of transparency that's at a level where the burden can then be shifted on the, the querier? I mean, how does, how does that work while still protecting the information? 
Okay, okay, so then I, I, my, my practical questions are usually for my co-author, but um, I'll give it a stab and then you know he can tell me later whether I, I, I got it wrong. Um, the idea would be that it would be between the organization that wants to share the data and the organization that wants to sort of use that data, um, working that out. The safe sharing site, at least our initial thought is that it's not so involved in, you know, what's that algorithm going to look like, what's that going to, um, that, that that's up to the other parties. It provides the controlled environment in which that happens where you ensure that that one party doesn't get access to the raw data. Um, so that's the idea behind it. Now there might be some sort of problems in, in, in thinking it through. I mean, one of the things we're interested in is sort of scoping out the thought experiment, but then we're actually interested in, in creating a prototype and trying it out. And so we have, you know, some sort of thoughts and leads on, on partners in, in Canada anyway that might have data and might want to try this. So that we can work out those wrinkles, because I think there's like probably a thousand practical wrinkles that um, might come up. So thank you. Um, I, my name is Monica Medina, and I'm a former government lawyer. Um, I suspect there are more and more of those out there right now. Um, and I used to work for an agency that collected a lot of data. So um, we were always worried about, about these questions. But I will say in response, just first in response to your question or your comment about the FDA and how they allow people to repackage their data, I'm not sure that's always so bad because having worked in the government, the capacity to do that when you're trying to you know, do all the other missions that you have is pretty limited. And so there really is a value add. And I will say, you know, my old agency was part of the, well, the weather service was part of it. And there are people who repackage all the weather service data and, you know, everyone has it on their phone. Luckily, there's no privacy imp Im implicated by that. So, but we do, you know, let companies make a lot of money off of that. And it's okay. And I think a lot of circumstances. Now, we're in the process in the government of trying to do another type of data collection in an in a area that hasn't had a lot of data collection before, and it matters a lot. It's natural resources, and um, in this particular case, it's fisheries. And if we don't start to collect this data and create these databases and, um, and really know what we're taking out of the water, we're going to run out of fish um, pretty quickly. And you know anybody who's sort of following the, the news on this, climate change, all these things are making controlling and managing fisheries much and much 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 more important. So if you had to devise a system right now from scratch, which is basically what they're going to do because there's never been electronic reporting, it's all been you know like on a piece of paper in a log book that you hand in. Even the electronic reporting is you come back to shore and you then enter it into your computer. How would you, you know, what are the most important things to do? Because that's about to happen, and we could do it wrong or we could do it right, and we need to do it now. So I'd be curious for your best advice on the two or three things that would be most important about, you know, a safe site, because that's probably going to have to have to happen because the government doesn't have the capacity to collect all the data, and about access to the data, and about enforcement and regulatory uses. So um, I couldn't agree more that uh, private companies are value added in many ways in these circumstances. And I certainly don't think there's anything wrong with what they're doing. Um, if I sound critical, it's only because I think there's some lost opportunities in that model. Um, and the idea that government doesn't have the capacity to do some of those functions is certainly true in our current reality. It doesn't mean that if we're imagining a new world, we might not decide to take back some of those as inherently public functions and make the public goods of that more uh, distributive. Now, and so, and so my, my reaction is just to take the one kind of example I'm most familiar with with information intermediaries and explore how the barriers that are associated with that may cut into some of the benefits that Lisa and David want their sh safe sharing sites to, um, to promote. Right, um, and I think there's uh, there's strong evidence that when you have higher barriers, the the folks that are going to use it are already kind of inside players. So you're going to get less of the kind of unanticipated or um, you know novice user or the kinds of innov innovation, right? The kind of ground up innovation that we hope for when we talk about open data. And the biggest you know, experiment with government published open data was probably President Obama's uh, data.gov initiative, right? And so I think 
uh, which many people have studied and had like a little success and a lot of failures. Um, but I think when we think about the trade-offs, that's, that's the kind of trade-off to think about. It's not to say that that might not still be where we come out because, because of the, the costs and benefits that, that inure to that. Um, on the other parts of your comment, I'll, I'll let Lisa to respond, I think, go more to her paper. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. I, I know I've talked to some people too who are uh, around sort of Great Lakes sort of fishery and, and, um, and other sorts of environmental concerns are very concerned about, you know, how do we collect good data and how do we share it across international borders um, in order to manage these um, things. And, and, and so I think that that's really interesting. In the natural environment context, the same sort of questions, I mean, I, I'm a privacy researcher and so is my, my co-author, so we're sort of focused on the um, sort of social data, data about people um, and, and how you worry about managing that. That's not as you know, central, though I guess it is in, the, in that you can infer other things about you know, who's fishing and what they're doing and, and in some of these contexts as well. Yeah, the rules um, are now, at least in the US, there's a, something called the rule of three, which is if you can narrow it down to three vessels in a particular area, then you can know who it is. So you can't strip out the, the privacy. And on top of that, the way they're going to solve some of the problems to collect more data is um, by putting cameras on vessels, and then you immediately have privacy concerns because the fishermen are sort of right. in, you know, the, the government is in their sleeping quarters, or at least they worry that that will be the case. And we're trying to figure out, okay, well, what's their right? Where do you, you know, how do you bind, you know, how do you keep the camera out of their, what really is their zone of privacy? Yeah, so I think in, in that context, I mean, that's uh, one of the contexts I was thinking about in terms of the, the jurisdiction questions and how they get co complex pretty quickly when you're trying to figure out what you can do with this data and the need, the pressing need to do to have it cross sort of um, global borders. Um, so the jurisdictional piece there, I'm trying to keep it out, you know, saying, well, you know, we can solve it simply for simple cases. And but I think this is one of them, and, and certainly it's come up in some um, discussions in Canada I've had with the people on our side saying we need to be able to do this now. Um, yeah, but it just raises its own sort of, yeah, yeah. Hi, um, thanks for a great panel and set of comments. Um, I wanted to just pick up on your invitation to speak a little about the data trusts um, proposal in Toronto. And I, I guess connected to that, I'm really curious, um, you, you said in your, um, in sort of backstory that everyone in Toronto is talking about the sidewalk proposal. And we had this mention of drug policy and biotech and other domains. And I'm just curious, as a scholar in an area where there's a lot of interest and a lot of people trying to carve their own niche, how do you think about the sort of broader consequences of you know, the contribution and how you work with others? And I guess my, my concern is that you get so much difference and of opinion, it almost becomes this sort of self-canceling noise. And in the end, what emerges is you know, Sidewalk's proposal, I think, is a very brash proposal to effectively call all public data, all data in an urban environment public, and to really skewer any kind of privacy of that, that data. So just, yeah, how you sort of have thought through that and whether scholars are working together to think about coordinating contributions and points of leverage and so on. Yeah, there's a lot of activity um, around the Sidewalk Lab stuff. So I mean, they have um, Sidewalk Labs has its own advisory. Waterfront Toronto, which is the public body they're they're partnering with, has its own um, advisory. They didn't ask me to be on either, but um, but they so the the. But the people on it are talking to the people who aren't on it as well. It's Canada. It's a small place, right? We all know each other. So um, <laughs> there's a lot of back-channel communication happening there, too, where people are trying to kind of line up arguments and sort of figure out where the points are. Not everyone agrees on, on all aspects of this. Um, but certainly that basic point that we're just going to de-identify everything and make it public, there's a broad pushback on that. There's a lot of pushback going on around, the, uh, around data localization. Um, so Sidewalk Labs doesn't want to uh, agree to data localization, even though this is data being collected in particular locations, right? You might think that that would be an example where you might want to keep it, right, in a data center in Toronto. And they're, re they're pushing back against that. There's uh, some resistance happening there as well. Um, the data trust uh, proposal is really interesting. Data trust is kind of a, 
a word that gets thrown around in lots and lots of different ways. So, I mean, it came up in the, the UK has this interesting report on, you know, AI and fostering AI in the economy. They use data trust, but there they, they mean sort of repeatable, shareable frameworks. It's kind of like standardized contracts or something. And, you know, and our kind of response is, no, do it our way. Um, uh, you know, don't, it's not just a contract thing. You have to build some kind of infrastructure to, to standardize and, and, and simplify some of this. Um, but the data trust use of the term in Toronto, and we only know so little about this because we have a couple PowerPoint slides and a blog post from Sidewalk Labs. Um, there are some consultations that are starting um, to happen, some of them sort of invite only and, and, and some of them will be more public, so we're waiting for more details. Um, I've asked some people involved, do you mean a trust, like legally? Do you really think this is a legal trust? Because I'm kind of dubious, like urban data in trust, like urban data, what's urban data? How do you define it with enough specificity? Urban data is not a thing that can be owned. I mean, we're gonna talk about ownership later, but you know, it's not a thing that's owned. And so if trust is a way of owning something, we've got a problem to start with. So, um, so how can you create a trust? And if you can get around that, um, okay, who's the beneficiary, the community? Really, that doesn't seem very specified either. Is it a purpose trust? There's problems with purpose trusts that are non-charitable purpose trusts. Could you set it up as a charitable trust? It doesn't seem to fit the categories of a charitable trust. So, like, just from basic trust law, I'm not a trust scholar, but I'm just kind of going through, like, you know, point one, point two, point three. I'm like, need to fail, don't know, unclear. Really, um, I'm not sure this is gonna. This is actually a trust. Um, and yet, in the public domain, people are like, oh, this will be great because then you have this enforceable way of, 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 of having you know, obligations for the public interest being enforced. And they're like, uh, yeah, but if it's not a trust, then it's not gonna work that way. You're gonna cobble it together legally in some other manner. And then there's all sorts of questions about, right? Well, who can sue who for what when everything falls apart? Um, so there's a lot of questions about whether it can actually be set up right now as a legal trust to give the public the sense that, right, the beneficiaries are the public. That's the intent behind it. It's a governance um, of data move, which is not a bad intent, right? It's a stewardship model to say that this data that's collected is going to be used for the public benefit and here's how we're gonna do it. It's the here's how we're gonna do it, I have a lot of questions. I'm like, I think you need some law there. Like, I think, you know, and then they're like, oh no, we don't wanna do that, that's gonna take forever. I'm like, I think you might need some enabling law there. Um, so, but again, we have like two PowerPoint slides and a, and a blog post in the public domain, so I don't know what they're thinking, actually. I don't know how they actually mean to, to leave. I asked this question to some people and they said they'd get back to me and I'm, I'm waiting, so um, I suspect you know, maybe it's not really meant to be a legal trust because um, I don't, I haven't had a clear, like, you know, you're wrong um, answer to that. So, but, but as a model, it's an interesting governance model where you could you create a kind of statute that says we can create these civic data trusts in this kind of a context such that we can get at some of the questions about how we use and steward this kind of data um, you know, in a, a model that's more around kind of private ordering or at least kind of, you know, in the kind of community sense, that might be a good model, right? Um, uh, but even if that's true, again, in the Sidewalk Labs context, they still wanna say, well, we're gonna steward this in, 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 in the, for the benefit of the public, and we're gonna do that by making the data open by default. <laughs> so it's still gonna do the thing that, that we're saying, oh, don't do that, right? No, don't release the data in, in this sort of public way. Um, strong rights of access, I'm totally fine with, just rights of access within a controlled in environment. Um, so you still have the problem that we're grappling with even if you do this civic data trust. To do the civic data trust, I think you probably need some enabling law. That's just my gut feeling about um, this that I have yet to be disabused by, um, by the folks involved, so. Hi, um, so I work on um, different kinds of sharing sites, but in a humanitarian context. And a lot of the technologies and systems that we're looking at incorporate distributed ledgers at some layer of their stack. And so I was hoping you could comment on the applicability of a distributed technology in this context. Oh, another practical question, I, I think. <laughs> I, or maybe you can give me your email and I'll have my, my co-author um, sort of get back to you. Because he did have a sort of thoughts about how we would create um, the sharing site in a more distributed manner. And, and, and for sure, some of the things about what we're talking about in terms of registry and stuff, right, could be implemented in the way you're suggesting. Um, 
I'm just, you know, a philosopher and a lawyer who relies on, on my, my tech buddy to, to answer that, but he has many answers to those sorts of things. So if you want to give me your contact information, I, I'll, I'll connect you. Other questions? Yeah, over there. Yeah. I'm just curious, uh, when you set up these databases, because I'm, I'm involved actually in a project now where we're using something called Hiccup, <laughs> which is a hospital database uh, where the federal government collects data from all of the states. Of course, there are only 37 states <laughs> are actually participating, and each one submits the data in some different form, and all the government does is give us that data. So the, we spent almost a year just trying to get it in some form that's usable. <laughs> so in my question in terms of your trust, how do you know that the data that's being accessed is actually going to be usable to the people who might want to access it. And I think that's a great question. I mean, um, our, our solution is not meant to answer that question. Um, so on our sort of uh, view, you'd be, it would be between the different organizations that want to do this sharing to kind of work out whether that's possible in terms of you know, how their data is structured. But uh, paper, I think is the next one, um, is all about um, how we deal with sort of data standardization and interoperability, and it's an essential piece of kind of thinking about the infrastructure here. Um, so stay tuned, someone else has a better answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> there are no other questions? Thank, oh, thanks. Uh, th thanks a lot, that was really a, a great panel. And I, I've done a, Earlier this year, I, I couldn't write. So Professor Kingsford where he told me I should read more and think more. So that's what I did. And I engaged a lot with uh, work by Victor Meyer Schoenberger, who's written a lot about big data and how um, in, in a big data economy, price loses rele relevance as a proxy for people's preferences. Um, but moreover, a lot of the value generation comes out of access to data. and that he ends up with some proposals to um, create some kind of mandatory data sharing requirements, mainly for competition law and policy reasons to enable enough actors in the uh, relevant space to in engage in um, innovative economic activity. Um, but as you mentioned, and it was mentioned before, there can, could be all kinds of other reasons for um, making data accessible um, and granting access rights to certain entities. Um, and maybe in closing this panel also, I was, I'm curious about your own normative disposition towards ideas that go into that direction because you, I know that your, your feeds work is very much relying on corporations uh, buying into the idea that data can, they can provide data for good, whereas Margaret's work uh, deals with a, a public law domain where the state is required to hand over um, data. So the question is, how is your normative position towards requiring more access uh, to information and how do you square that with the privacy interest? And does the safe sharing site proposal give you enough confidence uh, to push in that kind of direction? Can I just add a quick note before you answer? Uh, thanks, Thomas. Um, and also to follow up on that exactly, it, what other ways do we have, except for regulation that I know you love, um, to, to actually make companies participate in this environment, which I think is very useful and, and for sure safer for us, a society, but perhaps not safer for them? Yeah, the incentive question is a, is a good one. Um, uh, you know, there's a, a very early version of this where we're sort of playing with different kinds of, you know, liability rules and things like that to, to, to create that. And um, I, I took it out just because it became very complicated um, and, and, and perhaps is a different kind of um, paper. The, the access and privacy tension is really um, strong, but it's, it's always been there, right? Like data protection is not just about privacy, it's always had this access side in the public sector. 
Um, we've just never played with that in the private sector. So, so you know, we have all these you know public sector privacy laws around uh, you know the, the privacy acts most com and most countries have, and then you have the 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 public the private sector data protection laws. Okay, not in the U.S. but um, comprehensively, but m many other places, um, and uh, and and yet you know we have then the public sector access to information laws, but we don't have private sector access to information. And I think that maybe that's kind of a direction that you know we need to start thinking about going in and it's it's there's always been in that the public sector context a way of managing that tension um, and so it's not inconceivable to me to think that we need to manage that tension in in the private sector um, as well or is that this is you know um, deeply problematic it's just a tension to be managed and I think in some of the contexts um, you know I didn't um, answer one of the questions about well what how does this play into issues around you know algorithmic bias and all these other sorts of um, contexts um, and some of the reason we don't put more of a sort of the normative um, aspects of that in this paper is, you know, David and I don't always agree, so part of that's just <laughs> the co-authoring. But, um, but with the algorithmic bias, you know, a lot of it's interesting because the debates used to be, well, we need we need transparency of you know the the algorithms, right, and the, the source code and things like that. And it's becoming pretty clear that actually it's really useful to look at the training data. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but if you want to do that, you need a place to do that. You need a way of managing that, right? You can't just make this public either. Um, and, and if you want to manage the bias, you need to be looking at, um, you know, you can't just be stripping these sort of, you know, explicit identifiers. You need to be looking for the proxies and everything else. And so you need to be doing that in a controlled environment as well that's auditable. And so if we want to enable that, this is actually a method that which you could be um, using to do that as well, um, that would solve some of the, the more obvious privacy problems involved in, in fostering that kind of accountability. So, yeah, Well, right, please join me in thanking the panel for getting us off to a great start.